Welcome back. In the second part of our program, we're going to be viewing two more case studies about composting farm materials, and then we'll have another question and answer session to address the questions that you've been sending us. Before we begin, I want to again remind you about our phone number, 800-390-7551, uh, and our toll-free fax number, 800-803-5998. Nine, eight. We do want to hear from you today. Now, in our next case study, we visit a commercial composting operation that is recycling agricultural residues, and in the process, is helping to change them from a liability to an asset. John Gusick operates a commercial composting company called The Good Humus Man in Soledad, California. Every year, the company converts community green wastes, grape pumice, dairy manure, and vegetable culls from the nearby Dole Salad Packing Plant into 12 to 14,000 tons of compost, most of which is used by farmers in the Salinas Valley. The diversity of feedstocks adds to the flexibility of the composting process. In the uh, summer and early or late spring, we get a lot of grass in our, uh, our green waste, so consequently, we have to uh, add a little bit more carbon, which means that we'll use straw and wood chips and uh, the manure. So uh, that varies according to year, time of year. Uh, in the fall and winter, we get a lot of branches, so consequently, we need more nitrogen, and that means we'll use more, uh, more manures. And we use lettuce in lieu of water. We figure that every day that we use and apply lettuce, we save about 10,000 equivalent uh, gallons of uh, water. Composting takes place in two stages, first in occasionally turned piles and then in turned windrows. We bring our product in and uh, we blend it into these rows uh, and we'll turn it four or five times. Uh, we add the lettuce to it for the moisture and we get a lot of good microbial activity going into it. And then uh, it's in those piles normally about 30, 35 days uh, and we'll then take it and put it into the windrow, as you see here, and we finish the compost. And again, that's another 30 days. So we're looking at a minimum of 60, 65, 75 days from the beginning to the end. And then we trommel it, and it's normally in finished product form for another 30, 40 days. So our process is more like 120 days minimum uh, from the time we start with green waste and manures to the time that we ship out finished compost. This process produces a compost product without weed seeds, pathogens, or large particles, but it is not cheap. Uh, how costly is it to start an operation like this? Uh, first, we had to compact the, the ground. Uh, it's, it's awful tough to uh, try to work on a, a piece of ground that's not been compacted, and that cost us about $14,000 to level and, and compact. Uh, then we have uh, two, two loaders and front-end loaders. We have one. Uh, which is an IT28, and that's, uh, that's about $60,000 used. We have an old 950 that we paid about $20,000 for. We have two turners, and I think those are running about $18,000 a year. There are other costs, including a feed truck, a $30,000 screen, and $1,500 annually for permits and reports. Lab fees, fuel, and maintenance add still more to the cost of doing business. The sale of compost and tipping fees for the vegetable coals generate the revenue. We get $27 a ton here. We were 25 for five years, and this year, because of the increased costs, uh, the, the trommeling that we do, uh, we bring a trommel in twice a year, and that costs about 8000 bucks. But we're getting about uh, 8 $9 more than straight manure. And I don't think that that's fair, but that's what the market is. Uh, we have a product that is much better than manure. Uh, it uh, doesn't have any weed in it uh, because of the heating operation. It's taking care of any pathogens that may have been in it because of the heating again. And we get it up to 135, 140 degrees. And the, the grower themselves are very, very cost conscious. And if it didn't work for them and it wasn't saving them money, they wouldn't be using compost. Uh, it's not a cheap operation and it's not cheap to stay in it on a commercial basis. But for a farm operation, uh, I think composting is a very viable uh, operation. Yes. In addition to the expense for equipment, commercial composters also have to market their compost products and consider costs for transportation. Gusick's operation, which began in 1994, is located in a major agricultural region, 
so he has a natural market for the compost in his local area. Now we're going to show you our final case study. In it, we travel to Western Washington, where we look at a producer who has turned to composting as a way to reduce his farm costs, as well as diversify his operation. Provides a way to adapt to and even take advantage of surrounding urban development. Bayland Farms, a dairy and vegetable farm in Snohomish, Washington, started composting in 1995 to better manage manure. The farm has since expanded its composting operation, adding community yard trimmings to the mix. Don Bailey explains why he took on the extra task of composting. It's more work, there's no doubt about it. But the economics of uh, farming, the way they are nowadays, you, I think a person needs to uh, diversify or get very, very large. And in our urbanizing area, I don't know if, if getting real large is a good idea because then you're impacting the surrounding neighbors. So what we're doing is we're uh, receiving municipal uh, yard trimmings and mixing the uh, grinding the trimmings and then mixing them with uh, cow manure. We hope to make money on the compost business from retail sales and tipping fees and then also realize some savings to the dairy by cutting our fertilizer bill. Since we're a high growth area, it seems to be quite a bit of potential for uh, compost sales in our area. Balin Farms worked closely with environmental engineer Peter Moon to develop the farm's aerated static pile composting system. They believe that this method of composting is particularly well suited to the farm's mix of feedstocks, wet climate, and urban setting. The aerated static pile method has been around for quite some time, dating back to the mid-70s when they were doing some research in Beltsville, Maryland with uh, municipal biosolids. And uh, we've been using it here in an agricultural setting uh, for about two years. The advantages uh, are that we can control the oxygen level in the pile and consequently control the temperature and the process and maintain a, a desired moisture level in the pile itself. And it's really a very simple procedure of setting out a network of pipes and constructing the pile over those pipes. In this case, we're using five horsepower blowers uh, powered by three-phase electricity uh, to minimize the cost. The pile you see in the background here uh, takes up about five times less room uh, than does a, a comparable windrow system. In other words, you can get five times the volume per square foot using aerated static pile composting. When the farm decided to expand the original operation and accept yard trimmings, it was required to obtain a permit from the Washington State Department of Ecology. As part of the permitting process for, in fact, building the animal waste lagoon and also uh, getting the, the solid waste handling permit, you know, you had to notify all the uh, public and, uh, you know, ask for their comments. So that's basically what we did. And we got a couple of comments of a little concern over not the composting side of it, but building the animal waste lagoon to comply with the Department of Ecology for a dairy farm because of the odor issue. So what does the farm get for all of the work and hassle? The farm realizes a number of advantages from this composting operation. One, they receive a tip fee for all the yard debris that comes in. And that helps finance a lot of the equipment that you see out here as well as uh, the, op the overall operation in terms of labor and expense. Um, they are producing uh, quite a bit of compost and selling absolutely every bit that they can generate to the point where they very seldom have any stockpiles on site once the season really kicks in. Uh, because of the aeration, uh, it's a superior system because we're killing off the weed seeds, we're killing off pathogens, and when you're selling to the public, you want to make sure that you have a safe product. 50% of the material is used on the farm, and that's part of the zoning and the regulation for their solid waste handling permit. And they've realized in those areas where they've land applied the finished compost, much higher yields, partly due to the nutrients and the soil amendment characteristics, and partly because of the moisture retention uh, capabilities of the compost. We feel that composting and farming make a good mix because we're uh, actually able to use the free organic materials on our farm, get paid by a garbage 
company to receive the yard trimmings and get revenue there, mix those two things together, and then use it to save money in our cropping operation by buying less fertilizer. We're back now in our studio with our four panelists uh, and are going to start answering your questions that you've submitted to us. We've received a number of questions and we're very pleased about that. Um, if we are unable to answer your question during the show today, what we plan to do is to address the questions on our website, and we'd like to, to present that for you right now. Our web address is www.aste.usu.edu slash compost slash the web address is in the resource materials that you received today uh, when you registered for the program. Uh, also, you may submit your questions or continue to submit questions to us at our email address, and I'll review that again. The email address is cerwa at uidaho dot edu. Uh, and we will continue to take those questions uh, after the program. Be sure that uh, you present us uh, as much information in your question as possible. Okay, let's start with some of the questions we have, and these cover a, a variety of different areas. Here's a question from Wenatchee, Washington, and it asks, what methods are available to decrease the pH of cattle manure-based compost? It says that they have a high pH compost and high pH soil from alkaline irrigation water. Dan, would you like to address yeah, that? Yeah, <clears throat> we had a little uh, response to that. Uh, our pH is quite high here because we have basically a cattle manure and bedding operation as well. And uh, we did some, some uh, study on that and we were able to include some urea and some sulfur and we were able to drop the pH from 9 to about 7 uh, for a specific application and it was a viable thing to do. Uh, it would not fit the organic market of course because you're putting in a, a product that's, um, that's not uh, conducive to their operation. But you can reduce it with, with a uh, urea-based fertilizer and sulfur. Okay. We have a question that came in early on from Parker, Arizona. Uh, the question is, does composting kill aflatoxin? And I guess I'll direct this to Bob. Uh, toxicology ecology type question. I can confidently say that I don't know. Um, but I have a guess. And my guess is that, yes, it does. The toxin does decompose during the composting process. And the composting process also probably eliminates or at least greatly reduces the, uh, the organisms that produce the toxins. But in reality, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any research on, on that matter. I've been told that CAST has a fairly, um, a fairly good report about aflatoxins generally, and maybe there's some clues in that. So if, uh, if the person who asked the questions wants to seek out that CAST report, Maybe there's some answers there. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Franklin County, Idaho. And uh, I guess I will direct this to Peter. This is a regulatory question, and it asks, what regulations are composters dealing with in containment materials and water runoff? The permitting issues are really a complex one in that every state has its set of regulations to follow. In Washington State, uh, that authority is... Uh, delegated down to the county level and while it's state regulation each county has its own interpretation of those regulations and so it's a county by county issue uh, in our state um, agricultural composting in and of itself does not require a permit with the exception that if you get to such a scale that you are potentially impacting surface water and groundwater that they may step in and require that permit in place uh, in, in the case of the last case study you saw, Bailey Compost, we are composting on a concrete slab that drains to a sump. The leachate coming off of the piles are transferred into a, a waste handling lagoon, and then those are land applied during the appropriate times of the year. So that's the way we handle it there. Um, what I can say about permitting is that it is a fairly complex issue and it is regionally based. Uh, it's different in arid climates such as eastern Washington or further east than it is in the western part of the, uh, the coastal areas. Uh, 
it's not an easy answer. Oftentimes you'll find that the regulators themselves are not clear on what is expected and therefore you need to develop a good working relationship with those people. Oftentimes what I suggest is starting small so that everybody develops a level of comfort with the method of composting that you're doing and the, the size of the operation, the types of materials that you're composting, and grow from there. And that way everybody can grow in their level of comfort with that, with that operation. Have, Dan, have you had similar uh, experiences with regulatory issues in terms of uh, so oh, yeah. an uncertain process? Yeah, we, uh, we are regulated uh, not only by the Department of Ecology, but also our, our local county level. And we had to be permitted. And I didn't get involved too greatly with that because our environmental horth, uh, health organization here on the campus uh, dealt with that exclusively and, and uh, got our permit in place. Okay. Uh, here's a question that comes to us from Hawaii. We're glad to have Hawaii online with us today. How are uh, insects and other critters excluded from finished compost before bagging? I, uh, Dan, you market a compost material from your operation. Um, are insects and other uh, critters a, a problem, an issue? Uh, we're not doing a bagging operation, but uh, I would say the number one uh, thing that will help eliminate critters is a, is a good hygiene program for your, for your site. Uh, it'll, it'll eliminate a lot of ills uh, that uh, you could have otherwise. Uh, typically the temperatures are so great that uh, any insect situations that what might occur are, are non-existent because they're, they're um, deprived of any living conditions because we turn that into the medium and the heat kills them. Other critters that are on the site are just typical of our environment, uh, wildlife species that kind of come and go, but they're not an issue because we keep things picked up and hygiene is the number one issue. Yes. Peter? Uh, I can add to that with uh, the turned windrow system, you are turning all of those materials into the center and they are being uh, heated with aerostatic pile where you are not turning that pile. Uh, the, the method there is to cover the freshly uh, mixed materials that you're composting with a layer of finished compost material to act as an insulative blanket, partly to retain moisture and heat, but also to um, have a, uh, serve as a vector control barrier. Any larvae that is in the fresh mix uh, cannot get through the 12 inches or so of finished cover and therefore uh, die as a result of, of the temperatures in the composting process. Okay. I would say if you're concerned about having insects in the compost or, thing, or insects you don't want in the compost, the number one, you want a mature compost that's been composted well enough. There's not a great deal of food value left in there. and if it's, if it's a real problem, then drying it to the point where um, there's nothing there for them to eat or can't survive in the dry conditions. Okay. Uh, here's a question that would probably be of interest to somebody who is just starting out, particularly in, in a composting operation. It comes to us from San Diego, California. And it asks, what are the recommendations for testing for maturity of compost? How do you know when it's ready, and, and uh, are there particularly good methods for doing that? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, an issue of real interest because uh, the question of when is compost ready, when is it mature, is, is, is fairly subjective, and it depends a lot upon the intended use. In fact, it depends almost entirely on the intended use. Um, there are some tests out there. There's a test called the Savita test, which is fairly easy to use and uh, actually measures carbon dioxide evolution as an indicator of maturity, how fast the compost is continuing to break down. Uh, most compost, however, most composters rely on, on uh, more down-home tests like whether or not the compost, a wet compost reheats. Um, there's a simple method of putting compost in a plastic bag, uh, moistening it to saturation, keeping it in the bag for a while and see if it develops an odor. Um, that's not foolproof, but it is one clue. Other people use uh, the ratio of ammonia to nitrate in the compost and, and watch that decline. Um, in most cases, you have to get a feel for your material and the types of compost you have and the market and your use for the compost and use those tests uh, after some experience. Um, and there are more complicated tests that are more scientific, but they're also more costly and harder to use. Okay. We have a question uh, from 
Parker, Arizona, uh, that I guess I could address. Uh, this is, they're asking whether or not the composting videos that are shown in the program are available for purchase. And I guess that's, there is the uh, intent with the project to put together a package of videos, correct, Bob, that will be available in the future. And I would say the best uh, thing to do is to check the website for information about availability with that. Good suggestion. Um, let's see, there was a question here about uh, using yard trimmings for or urban and organic, uh, I mean, urban yard trimmings for composting. I believe we covered that in our final case studies. Um, there's a question uh, about uh, vermicomposting. There's a couple questions, and uh, I guess, Bob, would you like to make a comment about what that is? And Okay. Well, vermicomposting is a process where uh, worms are, are used to uh, decompose and stabilize organic matter. Um, I have a little bit of experience because we did a research project, but it's a different, uh, it's a different process than, than the conventional composting process. Uh, relies almost entirely on the worms. Uh, it's not a heat producing process like uh, thermophilic composting is. Um, uh, but it, essentially it's a different process. I'll, is there a specific question related to it? Um, it's regarding animal mortality composting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, worms are probably not, would probably not be my first choice for animal mortality composting, although the imagery is kind of nice. <laughs> um, and the main reason is that the worms do not tolerate high temperatures, and if you're concerned about uh, reducing pathogens, really rely on high temperatures to do that most often. Um, and you can't be sure of that in, in vermicomposting because the worms will not uh, either create high temperatures or tolerate high temperatures. There is some indication um, that vermicomposting does reduce levels of pathogens. Uh, there's been some work with uh, municipal biosolids to that effect. Uh, but at this point, um, there's no certainty about it. Okay, yeah, Peter. I can add one thing. Uh, there are a number of facilities around that do take uh, thermophilic composted materials and go through a finishing process with worms in order to produce, one, worms for sale as well as worm castings as a as a product for sale, but it is in that case considered a finishing process. Uh, if you have viable weed seeds in your initial mix, those will not be treated by the worms, so you need to go through that um, thermophilic phase of composting in order to accomplish those goals. Okay. The product, however, vermicompost, or worm, the product of ver vermicomposting, vermicompost, is considered a very high quality type of compost, however. We have a question uh, from Eugene, Oregon, uh, that relates to the, the temperature issue, uh, and it mentions that in several case studies, temperatures 145 to 150 50 degrees Fahrenheit have been targeted, and they are asking, is that sufficient to destroy those weed seeds and other disease pathogens? Um, Bruce? I, we, we've done some work with weed seeds and, and did several, several experiments with it. Um, the 140 degrees certainly is, uh, probably somewhere around the 130 degrees is sufficient to destroy most of them. What we did find, however, was that there, there can be some very persistent uh, weed seeds that may not be destroyed in the process. We usually think of it as destroying all weed seeds and it will destroy most of them. Um, some species it will totally, totally take care of the problem, but you can get some very persistent weed seeds like uh, field bindweed that has a very hard seed coat and uh, simply did not break down, could not guarantee 100% destruction. Um, other seeds would be destructed within, or would be killed within 24 hours. The longer the duration of high heat, the higher the rate of kill. Okay. Uh, related to that, and I guess this pertains uh, particularly to uh, using community yard waste, uh, is the fate of pesticides in compost. Is it the same type of situation? Peter, do you have any? information on that? Well, there have been a number of studies uh, since yard debris composting became uh, prominent as a solid waste handling uh, method and goal. Um, national studies have, have really focused on that issue of herbicides and pesticides, and 
by and large, it's found that, that the fate is not long-lasting, that there's not high concentrations of the, in the feedstock materials going in, nor in the finished compost materials. And I think Bob might have something to add to that through yep. his. Yeah, well, we just finished, we're putting the finishing touches on a literature review paper on the, the fate of pesticides during composting. And we looked at a number of studies which examined uh, the raw yard trimmings and other feedstocks, not just yard trimmings, um, for the presence of pesticides and herbicides. And in general, uh, there's not a, a great deal of uh, pesticides found in the raw product. Uh, mostly, it happens to be older pesticides that aren't used anymore that have a uh, a, a greater persistence. Um, and in the composting process, what few pesticides tended to be found uh, were, redu were reduced, except again for those persistent pesticides, which are going to take a long time to break down. But the levels were fairly low. Composting tended to reduce the level of any, almost any pesticide, um, and there weren't much there to begin with. So I, I wouldn't worry about uh, using compost made from community yard trimmings. Um, I might worry more about uh, yard trimmings from a single source where pesticides were used. But when you gather it all together, um, it's diluted quite a bit. Okay. There's a question here from uh, Oregon uh, related to uh, killing pathogens and weed seeds in, in the aerated static pile method. And so, Peter, I'd like to have you uh, try to address that there. Uh, how do you assure that, that they will be killed on the outside of the pile since it, they aren't being returned? Is that uh, an issue? Okay, that, that again gets back to the method of constructing the pile. Uh, you have the network of pipes, you put a layer of free breathing material over the pipes so that you get good air dispersion through the, uh, the pile. You then construct the pile of the freshly uh, mixed materials and you place a finished cover over the top of that ranging from 12 to 18 inches. Typically we use finished compost, unscreened compost, uh, that acts as an insulative blanket, which ensures that all of those temperatures in the, or the temperatures in all of the uh, freshly mixed materials do achieve those temperatures. It also helps to retain moisture. Uh, it acts as a biofilter for, for odor reduction. And there's a number of other benefits. And I like to use finished compost because when you mix or break the pile down, you're mixing older compost with the newer compost, uh, but it's all, it's all the same material. So you do have a very high assurance of um, pathogen and weed seed destruction. As a matter of fact, it's, it's covered very clearly in the EPA regulations uh, for biosolids composting, which is uh, sol wastewater solids coming out of uh, uh, municipal treatment plants. Okay, here's a question uh, for Bruce regarding the uh, composting large animals. Uh, mentioned that you had been doing composting of the, the dairy cows and uh, they were wondering how large are the bone pieces that you found during the processing and uh, do you have to screen the final product for the bones? Yeah, the, the bones certainly don't disappear. The bones persist in the compost and so if they could be screened. Uh, they should become very brittle and in the case of like the swine industry that have composted fairly large animals, the bones will break down on the distribution process. Um, so they will have to be screened or somehow they will be broken up in the process. If you have a, a very aggressive spreader, the bones will break. They're very brittle after they come through the heat process. Is that also an issue with the smaller animals? Uh, so the, the chickens, for example, the bones pretty much d disappear. There can be some, some in the process, but just the handling of them because they get brittle um, tend, to, tend to disappear pretty much in the process. Okay. Here's a question from Moscow, Idaho. Um, it asks, how many tons per year of compost are allowable under an on-farm manufacturing type of system? Are there rules or regulations that restrict that? How many tons? Um, well, how much compost? Some, some regulations that define whether uh, a composting operation is of this category or, or that category are based on um, volume. How much is either on the site at any particular time or how much runs through the site over the year. And those would differ from state to state uh, if they exist at all in a, in a given state. Um, in Idaho, I don't think the, that, that type of uh, standard is defined at all within regulations. So it would really be up to um, the local regulator and his discretion. 
and I doubt they would use that kind of uh, measure. Um, and I don't, myself, I don't know what, where the dividing points are in some of the other states uh, as to what makes a commercial composting operation from a farm, compo farm composting operation on a tonnage basis. Have you any experience with that? Again, it varies county by county in western Washington. Um, many of the counties, though, do allow for importation of bulking materials or other amendments to mix in with the, the uh, waste stream that is being produced on site. For instance, if you have a, uh, an egg poultry operation, uh, the material definitely needs to be bulked up. And what we do in that case is bring in uh, uh, wood shavings and horse manure from surrounding uh, equestrian centers. Uh, in that case, uh, there are no problems from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, looking at the volume that you're handling, again, I think it becomes a question, are you doing it in, a, in an environmentally conscientious manner, such that you're not impacting surface water and groundwater? And possibly more uh, important or obvious is, are you creating odors and bad neighbor situations? Um, the regulators do have the right to step in and require permits in those cases or to simply shut down your operation. There are, however, distinctions between types of composting operations. For example, a farm versus a commercial composting operation. And sometimes volume does determine where you, you fit into that um, in some states. I just don't know what that number is. OK. Uh, I guess I'll throw this question to Dan, as this comes to us from uh, British Columbia. Uh, what is the minimum windrow size for winter composting? Or is there a minimum windrow size? Uh, our experience tells us that the larger the windrow, the better heat retention you have and the better composting activity you, you generate. Um, our, our minimum size is because what we use, and it is subject to ambient temperatures, and it becomes a problem in the wintertime. And uh, our size, again, is uh, uh, 12 feet wide and 5 feet high, and in several lengths. But, um, the larger the windrow, the more heat retention, and then the better the composting uh, activity. So uh, the five feet by 12 is about a minimum we found in this environment here. OK. There's a second question I, that relates to uh, weather conditions. I, I guess I'll let Peter address this one, since he comes from the wet western part of Washington. It, it, it asks about composting in wet climates. Is that a factor? Well, it certainly is a factor, not only from the, the composting itself, but from the leachate management situation. In a, um, a composting operation as turned windrows, you have large alleyway spaces between the windrows, and uh, those can be impacted uh, by wet conditions, such as now you're handling large volumes of, of leachate. Um, with the extended area to static pile method that we have, we're minimizing that footprint. The uh, materials do absorb a fair amount of moisture, although our goal is to shed as much as we can. This year at Bailey's, which was the force case study, we're going to be covering those piles in order to minimize the amount of moisture that goes into them. Um, but um, certainly wet conditions are a factor. It, it is not only critical in the composting process, but once you go through the composting process and go into a screening system, if you're dealing with a wet material, it's very, very difficult and hence costly to, to screen that product out. So it's to our advantage to start at around 60 to 65 percent, end at around 40 to 45 percent, and, uh, and that's kind of the best range that we have found to work with. Dan, you had a follow-up? Yeah, just to follow up, uh, if you get too wet, your composting activity will actually stop, and then you'll have to add bulking agent to restart that. We've had some wet conditions here where we were really plagued with that that wet situation. Okay. I, I was just going to add sure. uh, the other side of that, it, not only the compost process, but we were talking earlier, uh, the access issue usually also helps control that as to how well you can get in to handle it. If you're on a very hard treated surface, you know, you can get in and, and work it. If you are on a untreated like the one uh, in Nevada, which has very low precipitation, you know, when it gets very wet, you're not able to process your materials. Definitely have different weather conditions around the West. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question comes from Washington. Uh, uh, asks about costs per cubic yard to produce compost. Dan, do we have an idea of what that is? Yeah, somewhere between, uh, well, 
three to six or seven dollars a cubic yard probably is a pretty good range. Depending on the type of equipment you've used, if what you've had to purchase to operate, people in a farm operation using equipment they already have are going to have a lot less into that. People in commercial operations have bought some specialized equipment; it might go up a little bit. But trucking and, and transportation are all part of that too. But probably a range of three to seven dollars a cubic yard. Peter. I could add a uh, rule of thumb to that with municipal uh, yard debris composting where you have a high cost of pre-processing that material, uh, shredding it down. The rule of thumb is that you cover all of your operational costs with the tip fee that you receive for those materials and that your profit for, uh, for that uh, composting operation is derived from the sale of the finished product. Okay. Uh, here's a question uh, I'll just throw out to the group. Again, it's from Washington. Uh, is the quality of the finished compost product different in a static pile? I guess I could throw this to, to Peter versus the frequent turning methods that we saw with the wind royal applications. Well, I think any, any of us could address that. Um, there are <coughs> quite a few differences. It's a, it's a topic of discussion, certainly. Um, among ourselves, we were talking about turned windrow systems where you turn it a lot or you turn it infrequently and what is happening to the, uh, the nitrogen in the process. Is it volatilizing or is it being retained in the system? Um, there's conversations of uh, the differences in hemicellulose in the materials if it's under aeration versus turned windrow. Uh, generally speaking, I think uh, you're getting a high quality compost with aerated uh, methods of composting because you are keeping it in the aerobic condition versus a turned windrow where you have uh, wide fluctuations in the oxygen content in that pile between turnings. And Bob, I'm sure you can add something to that as well. Well, I, I think the, the process that you produce compost does change what you get in the end, or, or what you get in the end depends on how you process it. But no matter what route you go, there's are things you can do to, uh, uh, to get to that high quality compost area. I mean, you might lose more ammonia in one, and more nitrogen in one method versus another. Uh, you might be able to get smaller, more uniform pieces in one method versus another. Um, but there's always post-processing and pre-processing that could be an equalizer for you. So, you know, I think you can produce high quality compost by any of those, the methods we've seen, um, with or without extra processing, it's a, and the feedstocks have a great deal of, of effect on the quality of the compost. Or its qualities, not necessarily its quality. Here's a question from uh, Stockton, California. It asks, have inoculants been determined to be useful in composting? Bruce, would you uh, like to try uh, to address that? Typically, there's plenty of bugs in, the, in our feedstocks that it's, it's not necessary to use them. There are some uh, products out there that can maybe start the process, give it a little jump start. Um, but in most of the experience that we've seen, it's really not a necessary ingredient to, to make your composting system work. Some people swear by them. Some people yeah. who, who use them, um, they seem to be credible in, in what they've seen and noticed. Um, some studies have found no, no benefits, so I think it's an open question. And I would suggest that people, if they're interested in using inoculants, to play around with them, see if they work. But it's definitely you don't need them. They're, they're not a necessity. Okay. Uh, there's a quick question about, uh, this is particular to obviously mint operation in, in Washington. Um, does verticillium wilt expire through the cooking process of composting mint? I guess it I would think the organisms that causes verticillium wilt uh, is uh, is destroyed during the composting process. Okay. We have uh, several questions have been submitted that, that are specific to crops in certain areas. Um, and again, due to time limitations, we we'll, won't be able to address them here today, but uh, we will. Our panelists have volunteered to uh, put together responses to the questions, and we'll put together a, a complete response on our, our website. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to take a few minutes and let you know about the second program in our satellite broadcast series. Uh, there have been several questions 
regarding the use of compost and the benefits of using compost, and we're glad to hear that because that's what our second program is going to be about. So here's a short preview of our next program in which we'll look at the different ways that farmers and growers are using compost. Compost and how to maximize its benefits will be the subject of the next satellite broadcast in this three-part series. Growers who use compost will help explore many different issues, including the value of compost and considerations for choosing a compost product. A well-made compost is enormously valuable for uh, you know, uh, protecting the health of the soil and especially the physical properties and the biological community in the soil because it's uh, basically uh, very close to uh, real humus, which the soil works so hard to produce and we, we work so hard to, to, uh, to protect. In addition, compost users will talk about the benefits of using compost, including available nutrients, enhanced water holding capacity, and increased soil productivity. My goal in compost um, would, would maybe be targeted at something my dad used to tell me. And uh, he used to tell me when, when he had new ground, he got 30 ton spuds. Uh, but after X many years, he'd only get 20 ton spuds. And he always called it new ground. And, uh, and my question to my dad was, what's the difference between new ground and old ground? And um, you know, we've put fertilizers down, we've put a lot of things down. And I think the difference is the microbial activity in the soil. And so um, if I hope to do anything, it's to, to make that old ground back as productive as new ground used to be. So join us for satellite broadcast number two, Compost, a resource for Western agriculture, on January 14th. For more information, check our website. This series of satellite broadcasts is part of a larger project called Compost Education and Resources for Western Agriculture, or SIRWA for short, and that's the name we're using in our email address as well. Now, SIRWA is a package of educational materials that are designed to help agricultural professionals learn and teach about composting and compost use. In addition to this satellite series, SIRWA includes a variety of instructional items. For example, there are slide sets, and an internet course is under development. There is a newsletter that we have that's called the Compost Connection for Western Agriculture that features stories about Western composters and lists important upcoming events about composting. And we've already told you about our CERWA website. I'd like to show you again that address, uh, which is www.aste.usu.edu slash compost. And that site includes many links to ma other materials, uh, the materials that we've used for, to support the program today. Uh, several of these items are included in the support materials that you received by registering for today's broadcast. Now, we'd certainly like to thank all of the producers and composters who permitted us to visit and videotape their operations. Uh, I'd also like to thank our four panelists who joined us today to answer your questions. Bruce Miller from Utah State yep. University, Bob Rink, University of Idaho, Peter Moon from Western Washington, and Dan Caldwell from Washington State University. I'd also like to thank uh, the SIRWA project team for all their hard work in assembling this program. This project has required the assistance of many different people, and we appreciate their involvement and commitment. And finally, we'd like to thank you, the viewers, for taking the time today to participate in this broadcast. And we certainly look forward to your participation on January 14th, 1999, for the second program in our series. Thank you.